this is about the size of the crowd I'm comfortable with too. And it's very strange to hear myself. So I teach, um, I'm from Utah. And so I teach at a little college out there. And so uh, the presentation thing is a little bit of a different vibe. I'm, I'm much more used to the whole students and asking questions. So let's do that. Ask the questions and, and that kind of vibe. Um, and so I'll, other than that, I'll just kind of get into it and introduce myself. Um, so I am married to three kids. My wife is super thrilled that I'm here right now and not at home helping with the three kids. Uh, if I look tired, I am. Um, I, so I actually ended up getting an undergraduate degree in Spanish linguistics um, at a school called Utah Valley University and then went to grad school for computational linguistics. And then while I was in grad school, decided that I didn't want to do a million more years of school uh, because it was painful and long. And at the same time, I got offered a job to work at a a solar panel company, and so I thought, all right, well, let's do that. And so I, I got to go join their team and uh, just teach myself marketing, and, and they were a great uh, fertile ground to kind of just play with some stuff. And since then, I worked at Route, uh, unfortunate victim of some of the tech layoffs recently, but I, you know, low-key big news, got a new job with a, a fintech company called Lendio, so I'll be working as a growth manager for them over there. Um, I teach at Ensign College in Salt Lake City. Um, I like to play some guitar. If you ever seen those one wheels, those one wheeled skateboards, I love those. Uh, I've only hurt myself a little bit. It's not so bad. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm I'm a normal human being with boring things that I like to do. Um, that's my family. They're great. Uh, sorry, my ki my kids are the cutest. Just is what it is. Um, they're great. I call that guy in the corner Skinny Dan. It's before he found his love for food. It's real bad. Um, so yeah, my kids are great, my family's great, and again, my wife is thrilled that I'm not at home helping with the kids this weekend, so <laughs> hopefully this is worth it. Um, like I said, ask me questions. Um, I'm used to kind of that, the student-teacher environment. Um, if you have questions, I, I, I will hopefully ask questions to you guys. Like, I think that's more beneficial. I'm not that interesting, and so like I, I think you guys will have interesting things to say, and so I want to involve everybody and, and make it entertaining. The other thought I have is, you know, I'm ideally here for you guys. I tell my students a lot, I'm like, you guys are paying me to be here. You know, uh, you're paying your tuition and that pays the, the couple bucks that I make here doing this. And it's kind of the same with you guys. You're paying me to be here. So I'm, I'm hoping that what I talk about is valuable to you, right? Like I'm, I am your servant in this regard. So like, if this is not helpful, please tell me. <laughs> I want to know so I can be better. And if it is, that's also really good to know. But like, I'm here for you. And so I hope this is, is beneficial and valuable for you. So let's get into it. Um, let me make a couple of caveats before I get started. There are more ideas than just these four things that will help you, believe it or not. There are a lot of things you can do that will grow your business and help your business, lots of them. Um, these are just four that I thought were valuable. And let me provide a little context too. A couple of years ago, um, when I was starting to get into SEO and, and WordPress and, and becoming a little bit of a developer, I came to a WordCamp uh, out in Phoenix, Arizona. I just figured, you know, I, I, I like WordPress, but I wasn't very good at it. I wanted to get some feel for what the community's like and what the platform is like and what I could do. I just didn't really know what to expect. And so I showed up at this WordCamp, a slightly younger man, uh, and not really sure what to expect, and I got a lot out of it. And it wasn't necessarily the things that I expected that I'd get out of it, uh, but I was very grateful for that. And so um, the reason I'm here today is not because I'm making buttloads of money and I think it's gonna work, but it's because somebody at that camp gave me a good idea. And so I'm hoping that I can be that guy who gives one of you guys a good idea here. You know what I mean? Uh, th that's really my goal is that somebody gets some value out of this. Um, and that's really how I run my businesses and my marketing is just providing value wherever I can. That said, let's get into it a little bit. Um, so like I said, these are just four strategies. These are not the end all be all strategies. Some of them might not work for you, right? Your business might be different. Um, but I am making a couple of assumptions about who you are, and I'd like you to tell me if I'm right or wrong so that when I'm kind of catering what I'm saying, it makes sense to you and it's applicable to you. Uh, first, you have some kind of product market fit. Is everybody relatively familiar with the term product market fit? Raise your hand if you're not familiar with product market fit. Okay, let me explain. Um, does your market like what you give them, right? If you sell a t-shirt, does your market need a t-shirt? Maybe it's a bunch of people who don't have shirts. That's a perfect product market fit. Um, it's, for most of you guys, it's probably more like you are selling websites to people who do not have and need websites. So there are varying degrees of product market fit. You can get all sorts of in the weeds, but basically it's you have something, somebody needs something, you're working with those people to make that happen. 
Does that make sense? Are we clear on product market fit? Thumbs up if you like that. Thumbs up if I'm crazy and really crazy. Just All right, I like it. Good. Um, you have some kind of monetized product or service, and you want to take that to the next level. You don't have to, but it's certainly easier if you do. Um, if it's a blog, if you're doing a design thing, if you are running a development agency, it's a lot easier if you're making a little bit of money on it. I think adding some money to the hobby kind of slaps you in the face with like the, do I really want to do this? <laughs> you know, and so because crossing that, that line from hobby over to business is a big jump. And I think getting a little bit of money and a little bit of time dedicated to that is sort of the wake up call of, yeah, I do or do not want to do this. My wife has a couple of times, she's a Disney junkie. And a couple of times she's been like, I think I want to start a Disney blog. I'm like, great. Like I know how to make that work. Like she's a software engineer and so she could build the website. I know all the marketing tricks and she'll start and write a post or two. And she's like, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm like, I don't think you do. Yeah, so I think one of the best things you can know is, do you actually want to do this or not? So hopefully a little bit of money helps you to know, yeah, I do want to do this. This is something I could actually do. I think it will be valuable. Um, then my last one is you're doing something WordPress related. Is anybody here not doing something WordPress related? I'd be really surprised, but I'd love to know. Yeah, what do you got? Okay, that's cool. And probably not super WordPress. Anybody else not like super WordPress related? It's okay. I'm not gonna like this is not like a I'm gonna kill you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Is that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So he said he's an attorney. But kind of a hobby. Okay. Great. And that's just great. So, and I ask that mostly because the advice that I'm giving is the advice that I'm giving to Dan from a couple of years ago who was trying to do some WordPress stuff and some SEO and some development. But I think some of these principles and tips will work for attorneys and they'll work for healthcare, they'll work for other places, but they might just need to be modified a little bit differently. So let's get into it. Um, get specific with your target market. This like it feels really obvious to say it out loud, but it doesn't happen often enough, especially when you are going from hobby to business. So when I got started doing my own agency, freelance, SEO development kind of thing, I was working with my solar panel company and I really was enjoying the learning, right? I was learning a ton about SEO and a ton about development. Um, it was working, I'd built them an e-commerce store that was making millions of dollars every year. It was awesome, like I was feeling really good about it. And I, I decided, okay, I wanna scale back full-time work and start doing some contract work and some other side work because my learning is kind of outpacing what the company here will let me do, right? And I wanted to continue my learning and to, to know other industries and niches and, and explore. And so um, I decided to kind of go out on my own and I didn't really know who I was serving or why. I was just like, yeah, like small, medium businesses, SMB, those kind of guys. And I wish drastically that I had, had niche down, get specific with my target market, right? A success story of this is, like I said, I like my little one wheels. You guys know what a one wheel is? Have you seen these? Like, give me a thumbs up if you know what a one wheel is. Otherwise, I'm going to describe it like a goofball. Kind of. Okay. So it is a skateboard. It's an electric skateboard. You like balance on it, but it's got one wheel in the center. And it's got a computer and it's smart and you ride it. It's awesome. It's great. And I, I love it. I've been a fan for a couple of years. And I was like researching, Googling stuff. I was like, you know what tire pressure should my one wheel be at? How do I change the foot pad on the one wheel? And I wasn't finding a ton of answers. And so I was like, you know, I know how to blog this kind of stuff and I know how to make websites and I know SEO. I can get all these pages to rank and make a couple of bucks off it. So I did, right? And that's a really great example of niching down because <laughs> no one else in the world was creating one wheel blog content that was providing value to users. So now my blog makes like a hundred bucks a month. Cool, that's great, isn't that fun? That's a great little side hustle for me. It pays for my other one wheel accessories and I love that. But there was nobody else to compete with. I was just providing all of the value in this one space. So. If you're working on web design or web development, find a specific target or audience, right? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a lot easier to target that market. So if you're a lawyer, if you work in healthcare, maybe you're designing or developing websites for dentists or doctors, you can very easily target that market when you're creating your products, right? If you're building websites, if you're designing websites, it's really easy to say, hey, look, I do websites for dentists. Right? And then on top of that, the more work you do with dentists or with lawyers or doctors or whoever, the more you get experience in solving the problems that dentists or doctors or lawyers face. And so when a new dentist comes to you and says, hey, I have all these problems, you're like, great, I have five dentists that I've already worked with or 20 dentists that I've already worked with. I bet you have X, Y, Z problem and I know how to solve all of them. You're that much better of a pitch to whoever you're doing that for. And I think, wow, you, are, you predicted correctly my problems and you know how to solve them? That's awesome, great. So it provides you some value in that you can be specific with the problems you're solving and you spending time to understand your customer problems goes a long way. 
It's, there's a lot of long-term lifelong value for that. So niche down, get specific. I've got a couple examples for you. Um, we, <clears throat> this is not a company I've affiliated with. Uh, I've used them before at other jobs, but what do these guys do? Who is their target market and what do they do? Just shout it out and I'll repeat it for the mic. Any ideas? Just shout it out. Sorry? What is it? Uh, yeah, it could be. It could be everybody with a website, right? So they're some type of a digital advertising agency is what they do, right? Unlock your growth potential. Okay, cool. Some hints might be like kind of right here. They've got some relatively big names. You know, typically that means, hey, people you've worked with, right? So like Calm is a pretty big name. If you can see Calm, is a, like you guys probably use the Calm app, right? Rakuten's big, Clover's big, Voodoo, everybody's pretty familiar. So like they're kind of trying to say, hey, like we work with some pretty cool clients, kind of the real deal, right? Um, they give us another hint at who their target market is in this form because this is a question they ask. How much does your company spend on paid media monthly? For those of you that are small business owners or even in healthcare or lawyers, how many of you guys are spending more than $50,000 on your ads? So this is probably not the advertising agency you want to be using, right? So the ad, we, when I was working at Route, this is the advertising agency that we used, and we were spending uh, like $5 million a year, right? And that was, they, they knew that market well. They knew very well how to spend $5 million a year, right? But if you go for a smaller agency, they're not going to know how to spend $5 million a year, but they might be really, really good at spending $1,000 or $2,000 a year or a month, right? And so they're telling us, who they want to work for. That's, that's kind of what they're, they're trying to help us understand here, right? So you should be doing this in your marketing too. There's lots of ways that you can niche down and tell people, hey, here's who I work with, right? In your web design, in your own website, in your marketing, whatever you do, you can be telling people, here is who I'm targeting and I'm doing it like pretty explicitly and a little bit more subtly with like the voodoo and the Calendly. It's like, oh, those are like pretty big names, right? They've probably got big ad budgets. So tell your customers when they visit your website, who you are and who you want to work with, right? Because if a doctor lands on your dentist website, could be a fit, but maybe not. You know what I mean? So be specific. Uh, who is this? <laughs> this is my aunt's company out in Utah. Who do they target? Uh, he said brides. Not quite. Moms, parents, little girls. That's correct. Yeah, so this is a princess party company. You hire a, a princess to come to your daughter's birthday party, and it's cool, right? How are you guys able to infer that this is a company for, uh, Brides is a good guess for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great guess. How are you able to infer parents or kids? You know, just kind of shout any answers. What clues were there that gave that away? The image, right? What's in the image? You got a princess, <laughs> pretty clear, and then a bunch of little girls, right? So are they targeting a bunch of little boys? Maybe, but not quite as explicitly, right? So this is a good example of like, they are pretty clearly targeting who exactly they think they they want to be targeting. That's not to say that other people can't. They also have heroes and like Spider-Man can come to your party. But the majority of what they do is targeting this kind of person. And it's clear, right? You don't really need to read anything or see the rest of the site. They're telling you straight up, this is who we hope you are. This is where we think it's the best case scenario, right? So they've got a very specific niche. Any questions on niching down specific topics? Not all right? Everybody like thumbs up, we're like okay with that. Thumbs down, thumbs, Dan's kind of crazy and talks too fast. I get it. Okay. Um, Conversion, conversion focused website and experimentation. This is my bread and butter. I love this stuff because I'm a dork. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to dive into this. One of the mistakes that I made when I was building my website for my freelance, for my agency stuff, is I had somebody come and design it. I hired somebody who was, they were a pretty good designer, but I didn't really know what I wanted somebody to do when they got to my website. Right? Um, and let me go back a couple examples. Right here, there are two actions you could take. Well, two actions that are implied that you should be taking on this website. What are they? Anybody got any guesses? Contact us and what we do. Exactly right, right? One of them is action, one of them is informational. That's pretty good, right? What about right here? Oh, sorry, not oh, this one. What's the, the action? There's only like one that they want you to take. Check availability, that's right. And so that's one of the problems that I see consistently across smaller websites and just web developers in general is what do you want this person to do, right? This is one of the benefits of having somebody who's a marketer but also a developer and also a designer. If you can find that, that's great. But work together with all these people here. Some of you are designers, some of you are developers, some of you guys are marketers. This is a good group of people who can work together and help answer these questions. But if you've got a website right now, what 
do you want somebody who gets to your website to do? Do you have a clear action? Does that make sense? And then how do you know that that is the right action or not, right? Maybe you have a check availability button. How do you know if that's the right action? As it turns out, interestingly enough, the most popular page outside of the home page on this site is the pricing page. We just that's I can see that in the data analytics. That's interesting. So I, I'm not really sure what to do with that information, but I think that's interesting information nonetheless, right? So I want to give you an example. <clears throat> At my last company, um, Route, they are B to B to C. What that means is they're business to business, but also to consumer. So they have two different products. One of them is merchant facing or, or business facing, and one of them is consumer facing. The website that I maintained was primarily focused on the merchant or the B to B side but the large majority of users came from the B2C side. Unfortunately, we only had one page that was dedicated towards the B2B, B2C side. The rest of the website was more merchant or business to business focused. And so we had contact forms all throughout the site. That's great, people were filling them out. The problem is something like 65% of the people who filled out the contact forms were consumers or B2C clients, not B2B clients, not the people that I wanted to be filling out these forms. And so we had to try to figure out how do we reduce the amount of people who are filling out forms incorrectly, right? Because th that's not providing a good customer experience for them, and it's not helping us generate more leads. It's not providing a good experience at all for anybody, right? So we did a bunch of tests. One of the tests we ran, here was our old form. So we ran what's called an A-B test, where you take 50% of the traffic and you send it here, and you take 50% of the traffic and you send it somewhere else. Are you guys a little bit familiar with that? Basically, it's just saying, we know that the action that we care about is somebody submitting a form. A form submission is our conversion action, and we want to know, are more people submitting forms on this form or on this form? Can you guess which one got more submissions? Which, okay, hold up a one if you think it's the first one, or two if you think it's the second. Let's take a, let's take a poll. Two, we got two, we got a one, we got a one, we got a one, we got a two, we got a two. I'll tell you, it was this by about 30%. It was a lot more. Part of the reason is because there's a little bit of like a sunken cost fallacy where you hit, you enter your email, you hit enter, and then the form pops up. And so you're already like, ah, you got me. You know, I want to finish this form. You know, it's because like you don't want to back out and end the whole thing. But then on top of that, we have an option where you can figure out, are you a merchant or a shopper? If you click on shopper, you're directed totally different place. We don't want you to fill out this form. This is not for you. If you're a merchant, then we have basically the exact same form, a little bit simplified, but not much. You know what I mean? And we saw a huge improvement in the overall form submissions on this form. And, and this was a great way for us to experiment. Okay, we know that this form, for whatever reason we might suppose it might be, we didn't do any experimentation to figure out why this form was better. I have some guesses, you probably have some guesses. But we didn't really know why, we just know that there was a 30% increase in form submissions on this form. So it was very clear this was the right conversion action and displaying it in this way was the right way to display it. And so uh, this all comes back to what do you, what action should people be taking on your website? What is the conversion action, right? Maybe it's reading a blog post if you're primarily a blog, I, whatever it may be. What is your conversion action? Are you directing people to that way? And are you sure that's the right place to send people? Test that, prove that. Show me that you know that for real. I'm sure we're doing time here. Okay, website data analytics. This is also my favorite. I love data analytics because I'm a giant dork. Um, it's also, there's something about like watching people behave on a website that I find really fascinating. Like when you click around on a website, just when you use your computer, generally you're not thinking about who can see what you're doing. But if you're on a website, there's a log of every action you take and action's pretty loosely defined. And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, these, this is a log of all the most common actions on my one wheel blog, which I think is pretty interesting, right? Just to go through a couple of them. Um, where does my, the one wheel desk get its name? That's a type of one wheel, it's just an explanatory blog. Check out, first name, first name. People are filling out forms, add to cart, uh, link to that place, that's a research thing, link to one wheel market, link to, so like, clearly I can see what people are doing on my site, that's pretty cool. All of you can see, this is a free tool, it's called Heap. You can also do it with Google Analytics. You can see what people are doing on your site. If you don't know what's happening on your site, it's very difficult to make decisions about what you should be doing on your site. So let's imagine, um, this is the case with uh, a friend I was helping recently. They were running some ads to their, their website and they were hoping people would convert, but they didn't have any data analytics or tracking information on their website. So they were spending you know, 500 to $1,000 a month on ads and occasionally it led to form submissions and phone calls. 
So she came to me and was like, hey, I can't figure out like why my ads aren't performing well. It seems like I'm getting fewer phone calls. I was like, oh, okay, well, what, what's happening on your website? She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, what do you mean, what am I talking about? What's happening on your website? She's like, oh, I have no idea. So we installed data analytics on her site, and it happened to be this princess party site. Found out that the prices page is the most common. We ended up revamping her site a little bit, and it's doing a lot better. We were able to identify what the actual conversion rate is instead of just taking a guess, because you dump $500 in the machine and hope you get a phone call out of it. Now we actually have data. We can track this journey. We can understand what's happening. So if you don't have some kind of analytics on your site, you should get it, right? Google Analytics is free. Heap has a free version. Both of these are great. I'm not an affiliate. I wish I was. I love the products. Um, they're great. But if you don't have information about your site, you should have it. You should get it. Any questions on analytics or anything like that so far? That feels like the easiest pitch, like have analytics on your site. It's going to help. It's pretty cool. It's worth exploring a little bit too, right? So I've got some calculators. You can see who's engaging more with my calculators. You can see which pages are the most viewed. Ooh, my mic's falling. Um, here's the initial landing page, and I can see who did other stuff afterwards. That kind of teaches me some more information over here about like what are my most viewed pages, how many users are visiting these pages, where are they clicking. What's cool too is I can then define these events, right? So the heap the program tracks all these actions, and I can say, hey, that's an action that I want to define as a conversion action. So I can give it a name, and I can say, okay, this is my conversion action. If this action is occurring, show me everything that happens before that conversion action. And I can understand, kind of like what Chris was saying before, I can understand these user journeys and these user flows, and say, okay, if this is my conversion action, people are visiting six pages before they get to my conversion action page. Okay, how can I simplify that process? Six pages is a long time. Maybe if I simplify it to one or two pages, provide all that information in one location, people will be more likely to take a conversion action. Just having this accessibility to information allows you to make better decisions. So if you want to make good decisions about your business, whatever it may be, you need to understand what's happening on the sales tool that is selling while you're asleep. You just got to know. Questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias? Nobody's afraid of spiders? I don't believe you guys. That's not true. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is my last big note, and that is high quality content production plus distribution. There's been a lot of talks on this kind of stuff, um, whether it's podcasting or blogging or video production, whatever it is. If you don't have content, you're just hurting yourself, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, has anybody Googled anything today? Has, it, <laughs> has anybody not Googled anything today? One person is not, two people have not Googled. I should, that's actually really impressive. Um, when you Google things, you get a result. Where does that result come from? I mean, Google, but where is Google getting these answers from? Generally, it's people like you and me who are writing answers to content or questions, right? Sometimes it's a business, sometimes it's just people who are providing information, sometimes it's educational, but somebody has written down, or more and more recently recorded a video or a podcast of somebody answering a question, right? So you can be the search result, you can be the answer when people are Googling things. And um, let me see what my next slide gets to. Let me give you a couple of examples. So first of all, I say this to a lot of people, <coughs> and the, the overarching point primarily is don't write really crappy content, which feels really obvious, but surprisingly is not. Um, I think everybody who's ever started like a web designer, web development business has probably written an article about why you need a web designer or why you need a web developer. But how many of you have ever read somebody else's blog about why you need a web developer or a web designer? Gasp. No one's ever read that article. <laughs> One guy's read that article, I like it. So. That content is providing value to somebody, but much less frequently, right? So what I want to do is show you some examples of really good content that you should be producing. This is from HubSpot. They're like the kings and queens of really, really great content. Because every time I look through their couple of uh, topics, I'm like, dang, I want to read that article. That sounds really compelling. First one, how to create a social media calendar and plan your content. Is that not compelling to anybody in here? That's pretty compelling. That's, that's a good article. That's a clever title because it's going to provide value, right? Let's go to the top, how to drive attendees to your next event, literally according to Uber for business marketing director. Well, that's pretty great for a lot of reasons. Where's the WordCamp organizers? I'm sure they're like, oh, that's a good, I should read that article because guys from Uber are gonna tell us how to drive event traffic. That's awesome, right? Point no one to. So how to create a sales plan, create an outstanding marketing plan with templates, templates, templates. So there's all this value that they're providing in their content, right? 
I like to think of, I'm a little bit obsessed with YouTube content creators, and I think there are more similarities between YouTube content creators and written blog content than we think about. Is anybody in here not familiar with guys like Mr. Beast or Mark Rober, or like really big names on YouTube? Is everybody pretty familiar with those names? More or less, okay. Um, who can tell me, <laughs> why does Mr. Beast make the best content on YouTube? Why is his stuff the most viewed? Any ideas? He spends a lot of money, okay. That, he's done the most tests. Is that what you said? Yeah, I, I, that is very interesting that we should explore. What else? Yeah, he helps people out, for sure. There's a philanthropy aspect of it. What else, any other reasons? So putting himself out there, okay. Vulnerable, authentic. He buries himself alive. Right. He buries himself alive and, ha and talks about that experience. Yeah, these are all really great examples. And we all keep coming back to watch the next content. It's not teaching you anything about business per se, but it's very valuable content in that it's entertaining, right? How many of you guys are consistently going back to any blog's website and reading their content? Probably maybe a few, but is anybody here like actively subscribed to a blog from a business and reading it a lot? One, one or two people, so a couple, but like generally, Businesses are very guilty of producing what we call like SEO content. That is not this. This is very good, high quality content. Like this is a blog I do subscribe to because it's actually providing value. You know what I mean? Um, another example, this is Neil Patel. He's a bigger name in the SEO space. And I just scrolled through a couple of them, but he's always got really good, like, I don't want to call them quite clickbaity headlines, but they're right on the line of like, you got me, you know? So he's got nine content marketing trends to increase your traffic. <sighs> That's pretty good. You know, my seven favorite SEO strategies, are they the same ones I have? They're probably the same, but I'm going to click on it either way. Best VoIP phone services. This has nothing to do with anything. It's definitely a sponsored post, but I'm probably still going to read it, you know? So point of this being, when you are producing content, you got to be providing value to people. So if you guys are an agency, if you're a development agency, if you're a freelancer, if you're a designer, whatever it is, one of the questions I get is, what kind of content should we produce? What should, I, should we write about, right? And the answer is, what questions are your customers asking? Right? Is, is anybody here design freelancer or design agency? Are we all developers? We've got a couple designers, a couple developers. What else? What else are you guys doing? What, what, just shout out like a title for me. You guys are all unemployed? <laughs> I know I got lawyer and I got healthcare. So you write things. Let me ask you, if you're a designer, let's hypothesize with me, right? If you're a web designer, and you have an agent, let's play this game. Let's go to the princess game, right? The princess party company. This is my aunt's princess party company. What questions do you have about my aunt's business? Because to a degree, that should be defining the content she's writing. You might wonder, how much does it cost? And that's why the pricing page is the most viewed page. You might wonder, how does the whole thing work? Like a princess just shows up and throws the party? I mean, all right, that's, that's a blog she can and should be writing, right? Maybe, uh, I've suggested this one to her a couple times, how to throw the best Elsa birthday party, right? Because even though she's located in Utah, there are people in Florida who want to have an Elsa-themed birthday party, and she can be providing an answer for that question that builds authority and builds trust with her audience, right? So even if you're not directly monetizing and profiting from that contact, you're getting traffic and you're building trust and authority, right? So if you run a design or development agency, if you're a freelancer, you might be saying, I mean, please don't write why you need a designer for your website. Everybody knows that. You know, like, what are the questions people are asking you about your business, whatever it may be? Why do you write? You know, what what is it that you write about? Why do you do this? How does this work, right? A um, couple examples coming back to my one wheel thing. I'll toot my own horn a little bit because this is one that I've done pretty well. Um, like I said, I, when I was, I was first Googling stuff about my one wheel, I was getting into it. There's a lot of YouTube videos about it, but there's not a lot of written content about it. And so I was like, watching videos where people are talking about this one-wheel VESC, V-E-S-C, and I was like, I don't know what that is. And I Googled, you know, what is a one-wheel VESC? And I couldn't find what that was. And so now if you Google it, you'll see One Wheel Utah. It's my site, and I answer that question, right? So the other one I might have is, um, what's the best tire pressure for a one-wheel, right? That's what I was Googling, because I got my tire, it was at 20 PSI, which is how it came. It seemed pretty heavy. I was like, can you reduce the PSI? Can you improve, like, what's, what's the best? So, and I couldn't find an answer, so I wrote an article about what the best PSI is for a one wheel. And these are my highest performing. This is in the last 24 hours that I had had 198 users on that one, 53 on the other, 39. So like it's not crazy traffic, right? But 
I'm also very specific. I don't anticipate that there are a million people searching for one wheel related content. But what I am hoping for is that when people do search for one wheel related content, or in your guys' cases, agencies or developers or designers or whatever, that you are an answer or the answer to the question they have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Question is, how am I monetized? I've got a couple things. Um, I put a bunch of Google ads on my site because that's easy and more, it's fine. Um, it doesn't pay a ton, but it works. I've also got some affiliate programs. There are a couple of third-party accessory producers, and I've reached out and said, hey, I've got you know about 2,000, 3,000 people that are on my blog every month, uh, and I love your products. Like, do you guys have some kind of a affiliate program, or can we, do, can we create some kind of a deal? Or if I send you guys traffic, that, that works out. They go, great, yeah, we'd love to have your traffic. So an affiliate program. Um, I've also got an Amazon affiliate set up because people occasionally will click on that. Like, I, I wrote an article around Halloween. My most popular article was, the best Halloween costumes with your one wheel, right? Because everybody who's got a one wheel wants to show off how cool it is, and so people create all sorts of goofy things. Like, people would create little Mario Kart setups, and they'd sit in the one wheel, and so, like, I would link to a Mario costume on Amazon. One of them was, like, a raft, and, like, a blow-up inflatable raft, and so somebody would, somebody actually purchased the raft off Amazon, and I thought that was cool. They'd sit in the one wheel with the raft and, like, pretend to be floating in a raft around Halloween. So there's all sorts of goofy little things. If my favorite one was... If you've ever seen those alien costumes where it looks like the alien is like holding you, imagine that, but somebody riding like an electric skateboard while the alien is holding you. It's the funniest thing you've ever seen. Uh, it was marvelous. And so that's primarily what I do. There's a lot of other ways you can do it, and it depends on your space, right? What I've found is the one-wheel space, because it's so new and there are so few people who are active online, there aren't a ton of affiliate programs, right? And so like my market cap is pretty low. Right? There are other ways that I can make money with a site, but it's kind of a hobby, and I'm not dying to monetize it to that degree. But there are a lot of ways you could monetize a blog, right? Um, you could be doing events, you could be doing outreach, you could be selling a product. As you develop an audience, you could be selling your own anything. You know, <clears throat> if I were gonna start a design or development agency today, I'd be writing a lot, and that's how I'd monetize my blog, is I'd be offering the product or service in my blog, right? So coming back to my aunt's example with her princess parties, I'm telling her, I'm like, hey, you should be doing some Amazon links, some affiliate programs, because when you're writing how to throw the best Elsa party, you can be linking to the products you actually buy and give to your princesses that they take to the party. Just use an Amazon link, right? Because she buys these little $2 crowns and some necklaces and some cheap dresses, and it's all super cute. But in Florida, they're not going to order from her anyway, so she might as well make a couple of bucks by somebody reading that article and ordering that product. You know what I mean? But... Every blog has some kind of a CTA. It's like, hey, if you're local, then give us a call and we'd love to have a princess come to your party. There are a lot of different ways you can monetize. It depends on your business model and what you offer and what people are willing to pay for. Does that answer your question okay? So, um, we can talk a lot about all this stuff, but any questions in the meantime? Also, that's my favorite gif of all time, David S. Pumpkins. It is the best. Yeah. One second. I'm going to bring the <laughs> mic to you. For the route example, you're looking at the second form that's sort of converting better. Yeah. Do y'all track like drop offs in each phase of that form? Yeah. And then do y'all, are y'all collecting like information to put them like in a funnel saying you didn't finish your form? Kind of hit them back that way? 100%. Okay. Um, you can get insanely granular, right? Um, and to a degree, you've got to go, well, what's the analysis paralysis component? When do we have too much data to act on? So generally, if I'm tracking a form submission, I will track clearly like their path, and I will tra track the conversion action. If I want to know immediately before that, I might consider form drop-off rate. What I mean by that is I'll track who has engaged with the first part of that form, that email form, and then what percentage of people who engage with that email part of the form actually submit the form. And that way I have an idea of, okay, so I know 60% of the people who start the form are finishing the form. Is that good? Is that bad? Can we improve that number? Let's try reducing the form fields. Let's try clarifying the form fields. Let's try improving the process. And so you can create a whole series of experiments around improving just that one form field. And it depends on your traffic, and you can, there's a whole experimentation game you can play. That's literally my day job at my new company, Lendio, is the experimentation component of it. Um, but yeah, it, it's a tricky line to walk because when you have access to insane amounts of information, you gotta be careful that you're, you're clear on what your success and your failure metrics are and what aligns to those so you don't get lost in the weeds and all that data. But that's a great question. Does that answer your question? Okay, okay. 
What else? What other questions? Cool. Then I did a great job or a really bad job. <laughs> yeah. Um, specifically with A-B testing, are you aware of some good plugins or solutions to use with WordPress to do that? Yeah, I have used, with WordPress, you can, depending on your level of skill, you can do anything. Optimizely is really good. Adobe's got some good ones. I've just used Google Optimize because it's free, and if you're just starting out, that's the best way to do it because it's free. It doesn't cost much money. I will say there are a lot of really goofy troubleshooting things um, with Google Optimize, but once you get kind of a system figured out, I found that to be super helpful. I was able to run not just A-B tests, but what we call multivariate tests, where I'm testing one headline and six paragraphs, or three headlines and two paragraphs, and seeing which kinds of combinations are leading to the best you know, conversion or whatever our success metric is there. But generally, yeah, Google Optimize is great, and it's free. So I love that one. <laughs> Hey Dan, I um, I walked in about a halfway through the talk. Um, what would you say is your one line biggest takeaway that I should take from this um, from the talk? That's a great question. I'd say it's provide value everywhere you speak to your customers. And my second like underscore bullet point in parentheses is know what your customers want. Um, because you providing value is fully dependent on understanding your pain points of your customers and providing a good solution for them, right? Um, having worked as a marketer and as a product manager, a product manager's day job is basically just to talk to customers and understand what's working and what's not. And if you guys are doing your own thing, you are all product managers and you better understand what it is that people want. If you run your development agency, what do your customers want? Yeah, a website, but there's a lot of websites out there, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, and what would you say is your biggest success story in doing that? That's a good question. I just have so many successes I have to think through, you know. Um, okay, so here's kind of a goofy one. Um, my one-wheel site, uh, I'll show you really quick. One-wheel Utah, cool. So I started this, like I said, just because I, I like my one-wheel stuff, and if I figure, I figure if I make 100 bucks, that's cool. Like it'll buy another little foot pad or something for me. So what I did, um, when I was working at the solar panel company, we were selling really cheap solar panels to, to DIYers, do-it-yourselfers, and I wrote an article about like the best Black Friday deals for solar panels. And I just figured, you know, like we're selling direct to consumer, most solar panel companies are not doing anything like that. And so I like, maybe there's a chance this works. As it turns out, we were the only people, or few, we were the only people, or, or one of the very few, who were selling direct to consumer. That article ranked number one for a long time and drove a crazy amount of Black Friday traffic. And so what I decided to do around uh, Black Friday is I know that the company Future Motion, who makes one wheel, only does a sale on Black Friday. And I know that third-party accessory makers, there are four or five big ones in the space, also offer similar deals. And so I basically just wrote an article that says, um, the best Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals for one wheel. And this got something like 12,000 page views in 15 days. Uh, and again, like you can see like some of my ads and some of my stuff, but like I'm not, like this isn't anything special. I'm basically just compiling data. So like it's, it's my biggest success because it's kind of a gimmick that it worked. You know, like I've had other successes that have generated revenue, but this is like, it's kind of my biggest success because it's so actually funny to me that this generated 12,000 page views and like 200 bucks in 15 days. Like that's comical, you know, but it was awesome at the same time, you know. So I'd say that's one of my bigger ones. I'm pretty proud of that, that I made a gimmicky little article that it provides value at the end of the day. If you wanted to buy a one wheel and wanted to know about these deals, this is absolutely the page you wanted to find, right? Like the deals that people have had in the past and accessories and third party, like this is providing really good value. But it worked, it ranked number one, and it drove a ton of traffic, it was super fun. So it was like, I, I, I call it a win because it was gimmicky and it worked. Now I can't see because the white background is like crazy bright, there we go. What else? I'm way too short for this podium. Questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias. Nobody raises their hand for phobias, you guys are a bunch of liars, you got snakes out here, there are snakes. Nobody's afraid of snakes, it's crazy. Okay, well, yeah, she's got a question. One second. <coughs> uh, 
thanks. Kind of going back to the data, um, since that's yeah. where your excitement is, I could tell. Um, you said looking at the site, um, well, looking at the data should inform what your site does for your customers. Mm -hmm. But Google Analytics is super overwhelming. So can you give an example about when you're looking at that data, what should you be looking at? And then what changes should you be making to the website? That's a great question, and it's hard to answer because it depends. But I would yeah. say that the primary theme around answering that is what do your customers care about, right? Okay. Um, let's use this Princess Party example because I think that's a really, it's very tangible. Mm -hmm. Her customers care about, they probably got to her site because they heard about or they were at a party where some princess came to a party and they, they, the girls were in love, it was awesome. And so they have Googled or they got a referral and they ended up on this website. And so we know that if you land on Princess Parties by Natalie.com, my aunt's website, you are interested in either information about what the heck that is and why that exists, or two, you are likely intent driven in that you want to take some kind of an action and, and book a party or have somebody come to your party, right? Um, if you're a web development agency or designer or freelancer or whatever, what is the thing that your customer wants out of you? Right, so like, tell, what do you do? Um, so me in particular, it's content writing. So yeah. putting the content on the website, not the developer. <laughs> right, and that's, what, you know, you, you might go, well, what does my audience care about, mm -hmm. right? And then how do you craft your website to making sure that they are getting value and having a positive experience, right? right. I, I think at the end of the day, most positive customer experiences across everything come down to trust, right? That's one of the reasons right. I start with the fun slides about my cute family is because I want you to know that I'm a human being who's kind of a goofball and I have three kids and I'm very tired. Because like it's, it's about establishing trust because then you see me as not like just the guy who's speaking in WordCamp but the guy who's gonna go home and be very tired again. You know? And so build that trust with your audience in the form of your content or in the form of your website by helping them understand and just you wanna show your customer at every step of the journey that you have thought about the journey that they're on. Whether it's digital or in person or whatever, you have thought through this and you're trying to make it as positive a customer experience as you possibly can. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, a little bit. It, it goes back to knowing what your customers want. And I guess you will look at the data to... And, and let me come back to that. that. Sorry, let me follow up with that. Because once you identify what it is your customer wants, mm -hmm. it's a princess party, it's information about a one wheel, it's to read your content, then you identify what are your success metrics. What action should somebody take based on yeah. them getting to your site? And that varies. What action should somebody take when they get to your site and read your content? What do you want them to do? Uh, fill out the form, the contact form, Great. to learn more about the services. And so there's a lot of ways you can go about that. You can say, okay, well, let's look at the form submissions. Let's look at form starts. And let's go backtrack even further. Let's say, how many articles are people reading before they submit a form? Are they reading one or two or three? Are there multiple? You know, which articles are the first articles they're engaging with? And maybe it's over a long period of time. And you go, generally we're seeing this article and then people click into the next article and then they bounce or they go somewhere else. And they come back to this article and this article is where people convert. And you can start to establish kind of a content funnel of like we know that this is ideally a flow that can work. Mm -hmm. And so it, it all just depends on your goals, right? And so I would say identify what is your user journey, your ideal user journey, and then how do you improve that? Gotcha. Does that Thank help you. answer it a little better? Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes it did. Thank you. <coughs> What else? I don't know if this fits exactly in what you do, but when you were showing the princess site, I'm assuming that it's all the princess. You mentioned Elsa. I'm assuming that it's all the princesses mm -hmm. everybody's familiar with. What are the issues revolving or involving copyright and things like that? that oh, yeah, it's a to ton. Deal with? It's a ton. Uh, it's not my business. I don't deal with it. Uh, if Disney, <laughs> so technically, as far as I understand, there's no problem until Disney says, hey, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> because the way that they list their princesses is like, oh, let's see, uh, princessbarbiesbynatalie.com. They list them all as like Ice Queen and like ice princess and like all these knockoff names, but like the picture is clearly them. So like if Disney decided at any point that they were gonna sue them, then it would be successful. But as I understand it, it's not a problem up until the moment that Disney has decided that. Generally, I don't imagine my aunt who's making like two or $3,000 a month is such a concern for Disney that they're gonna do something about it. But like, <laughs> you know, like I kind of crack up a little bit. Uh, Enchanted House Princess, Flower Princess, but Rapunzel is uh, not an intellectual property that Disney owns, so they can use that actual name. Cinderella is the same, but New Cinderella, I mean, like, that feels pretty explicit. Where's our lawyer in the room, you know? Like, this feels, <laughs> he shakes his head. 
<laughs> so, and you could probably get better advice than this, but as far as I understand, it's like, it's not a problem until the moment it's a problem, and then it's really a problem. Oh, uh, Star Princess, yeah. Star Princess? Yeah. Arabian Princess. I have a student from South Korea, and uh, this used to be Asian Princess, and he thought that was the funniest thing on planet Earth, because like, India is in Asia, so is she the Indian Princess? And I was like, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So now she's the Chinese Princess, which is a little bit more uh, accurate. Snowman, yeah, that's, I mean, come on, like, <laughs> we're definitely not inflicting any copyright there, that's fine. Um, I always, and then like, it's kind of funny because she always has this like disclaimer, we're not affiliated with Disney. I'm like, this is not gonna stop anybody from suing you. Like you having this does not help you in any way. Um, so anyway. Yes. Yeah, he asked if I think it's an issue of scale. If, if she got bigger, would Disney come after? I, it's a yes caveat, it depends, right? Because like, if you write a story and somebody is using your characters, you also might go, that's free advertising, you know? And maybe the princess comes to your party and you go, dang, we gotta go to Disneyland, right? And so like, to a degree, Disney might just be kind of like, eh, it's free advertising, you know? So yeah, lawyer. <laughs> That issue might also be whether it degrades their value or their copyright. 100%. In other words, if you showed, you showed one of those characters in a compromising position or if this, right. was, a, this was an escort service, then you, you basically would have a, a firestorm. Yeah, and that's why I think it comes back to it's not a problem until the moment that it is. You know what I mean? Right now, it's probably fine. The moment is a problem, it's not great. So <laughs> whatever, that's the risky run, you know? So anyway, I always thought that was kind of funny too. Like there's all these little things that they do that. I'm like, cowgirl, really? Like that's, how's that not? <laughs> so anyway. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Okay, great. Um, I had a question on the data analytics. Yeah. Is there any tools that would allow you to see where your user is coming from on your website? Like, yes. coming from Florida yep. or their demographics? Um, Heap will do that and um, Google Analytics will do that. We'll look at my Heap data because it's pretty fun. Um, it should be, yeah, this is my site. So I fed 50 people today, cool, that's great. Um, down here, I think I have a country and then I can go as specific as region and city, right? That's super nice. It's super interesting because one, I'm learning a lot about the one wheel demographic, but if you run any kind of business that is global or not, it'd be really interesting to know. Like, I mean, I, I'm based out of Utah and I, the blog is literally called One Wheel Utah and that is not even top five of the most visited cities, right? It's super interesting. So yeah. Um, What's the way that these data analytics platforms work, especially Heap, is everything in your code has some type of a name or a class or an identifier of some sort, right? And so Heap just logs all that stuff. So like I can come over here to live data feed. I don't know if anybody's on my site right now. Somebody on their computer go to my site and click around. It will log whatever events it sees happening. So like if you visit the site, if you click on a button, I will see that happen. It's pretty cool. A little creepy. Good information for when you're browsing online. People can see stuff. Um, but it's really useful for me to be able to collect information and be able to make decisions. Somebody's on my site, you and the blog, awesome. Thanks, good audience. That's what I'm talking about, you guys are the best. Look at all this traffic I'm getting. Google's gonna rank me so good. Um, anyway, so it's really interesting. I, and right, Some of these events are defined, right? Page viewed home is defined. Some of these are not defined. And so I might go, oh, these are worth defining. These are events that I'd like to track because I'd like to see where they fit in my funnel. Yeah. Heap is free, I freaking love it. Cannot recommend it enough. I wish I was an affiliate so I could make some money on it, but I'm not, it's just cool. Anyway, thanks everybody for your questions and everything and we'll get out of your hair. Thanks. Thank you.